The wave of protest that followed Sir Tim Hunt's stupid comments about girls in laboratories highlighted many examples of sexism in science. One claim was that during the race to uncover the structure of DNA, Jim Watson and Francis Crick either stole Rosalind Franklin's data, or forgot to credit her. Neither suggestion is true. In April 1953, the scientific journal Nature published three back-to-back -back articles on the structure of DNA, the material our genes are made of. Together, they constituted one of the most important scientific discoveries in history. The first, purely theoretical, article was written by Watson and Crick from the University of Cambridge. Immediately following this article were two data-rich papers by researchers from King's College London, one by Maurice Wilkins and two colleagues, the other by Franklin and a PhD student, Ray Gosling. The model the Cambridge duo put forward did not simply describe the DNA molecule as a double helix. It was extremely precise, based on complex measurements of the angles formed by different chemical bonds, underpinned by some extremely powerful mathematics and based on interpretations that Crick had recently developed as part of his PhD thesis. The historical whodunit, and the claims of data theft, turn on the origin of those measurements. The four protagonists would make good characters in a novel, Watson was young, brash, and obsessed with finding the structure of DNA, Crick was brilliant with a magpie mind, and had struck up a friendship with Wilkins, who was shy and diffident. Franklin, an expert in X-ray crystallography, had been recruited to King's in late 1950. Wilkins expected she would work with him, but the head of the King's group, John Randall, led her to believe she would be independent. From the outset, Franklin and Wilkins simply did not get on. Wilkins was quiet and hated arguments, Franklin was forceful and thrived on intellectual debate. Her friend Norma Sutherland recalled, her manner was brusque and at times confrontational, she aroused quite a lot of hostility among the people she talked to, and she seemed quite insensitive to this. Watson and Crick's first foray into trying to crack the structure of DNA took place in 1952. It was a disaster. Their three-stranded, inside-out model was hopelessly wrong and was dismissed at a glance by Franklin. Following complaints from the King's group that Watson and Crick were treading on their toes, Sir Lawrence Bragg, the head of their lab in Cambridge told them to cease all work on DNA. However, at the beginning of 1953, a U.S. competitor, Linus Pauling, became interested in the structure of DNA, so Bragg decided to set Watson and Crick on the problem once more. At the end of January 1953, a Watson visited King's, where Wilkins showed him an X-ray photo that was subsequently used in Franklin's Nature article. This image, often called, Photo 51, had been made by Raymond Gosling, a PhD student who had originally worked with Wilkins, had then been transferred to Franklin, without Wilkins knowing, and was now once more being supervised by Wilkins, as Franklin prepared to leave the terrible atmosphere at King's and abandon her work on DNA. Photo 51 taken by Rosalind Franklin and R.G. Gosling Watson recalled that when he saw the photo, which was far clearer than any other he had seen, my mouth fell open and my pulse began to race. According to Watson, photo 51 provided the vital clue to the double helix. But despite the excitement that Watson felt, all the main issues, such as the number of strands and above all the precise chemical organization of the molecule, remained a mystery. A glance at photo 51 could not shed any light on those details. What Watson and Crick needed was far more than the idea of a helix, they needed precise observations from X-ray crystallography. Those numbers were unwittingly provided by Franklin herself, included in a brief and formal report that was given to Max Peretz of Cambridge University. In February 1953, Peretz passed the report to Bragg, and thence to Watson and Crick. Crick now had the material he needed to do his calculations. Those numbers, which included the relative distances of the repetitive elements in the DNA molecule, and the dimensions of what is called the monoclinic unit cell, which indicated that the molecule was in two matching parts, running in opposite directions, were decisive. The report was not confidential, and there is no question that the Cambridge duo acquired the data dishonestly. However, they did not tell anyone at King's what they were doing, and they did not ask Franklin for permission to interpret her data, something she was particularly prickly about. Their behavior was cavalier, to say the least, but there is no evidence that it was driven by sexist disdain. Parrots, Bragg, Watson and Crick would have undoubtedly behaved the same way had the data been produced by Maurice Wilkins. Ironically, the data provided by Franklin to the MRC were virtually identical to those she presented at a small seminar in King's in autumn 1951, when Jim Watson was in the audience. 
Had Watson bothered to take notes during her talk, instead of idly musing about her dress sense and her looks, he would have provided Crick with the vital numerical evidence 15 months before the breakthrough finally came. By chance, Franklin's data chimed completely with what Crick had been working on for months, the type of monoclinic unit cell found in DNA was also present in the horse hemoglobin he had been studying for his PhD. This meant that DNA was in two parts or chains, each matching the other. Crick's expertise explains why he quickly realized the significance of these facts, whereas it took Franklin months to get to the same point. While Watson and Crick were working feverishly in Cambridge, fearful that Pauling might scoop them, Franklin was finishing up her work on DNA before leaving the lab. The progress she made on her own, increasingly isolated and without the benefit of anyone to exchange ideas with, was simply remarkable. Franklin's laboratory notebooks reveal that she initially found it difficult to interpret the outcome of the complex mathematics, like Crick, she was working with nothing more than a slide rule and a pencil, but by 24.